Is that a game of the year? New soap death scene. What do you think? Whoa, very nice. Picked it up from Infinity Ward yesterday. That's very Riz Bateman, but that's nothing. Look at this. That is really nice. What do you think? Nice. Jesus, that is really based. How to nitwit like you get so talented. I can't believe that Bryce prefers Van Patten's soap death scene to mine. You ain't seen nothing yet. Impressive. Very nice. Let's see Paul Allen's scene. If you're anything like this guy right here, then I know you're a good classic Call of Duty fan. He uses one of them good old boys who remembers back when it was about great innovative action set pieces and awesome blockbuster storylines. For now. Yes, yes, my friends, we all remember the good times, the simpler times, that long dynasty reigning from 2008 to 2012, spanning World at War to Black Ops 2, the golden era of Call of Duty. Who among us <laughs> doesn't remember those long summer nights staying up until the AM grinding down on some ascension because it's objectively the best zombies map, or playing Burn em Out on loop because the flamethrower was the most overpowered and fun thing in the world in our psychotic eight-year-old minds. Yeah, this is for what you did to Nan King, you filthy <laughs> fish. Um, that was, uh, that was really bad. Those days before the dark times, New dog model is they're all gone now. Train go boom. Yeah, Maloney, train go boom. <laughs> Modern Warfare 3 sucks. Why? What happened? One and two were good, so why does three suck so bad? I mean, I get that out of the original trilogy, MW3 was the weakest entry, but was that really something you had to emulate? Much less excel at? We never even got a Soap X ghost sex scene. This is the most disappointing climax to a bromance since Finn Expo. When will all those mass media idiots learn that the earth without art is just eh? <laughs> But hold on, if there's one good thing I can say about Call of Duty's L streak, it has given me a much deeper appreciation for the older COD games. It's one of those you don't know what you have until you lose it sort of things, or whatever. In recent times, I found myself replaying all the titles of the classic and golden eras. Even made a video about one of them. But I must confess something that will make all you real COD heads, quake in your booties. I have never played some of these absolute alleged classics. Yes, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In the comments of the Call of Duty 2 video, I got a ton of people saying that the real underdog of the series is this game right here, United Offensive. And I had never even heard of this entry up until reading these little quips. This is probably due to the fact that it's not a standalone game, but is instead an expansion pack for the first COD. By the way, for all the Fortnite wiping Genshin Impact attack and Roblox for European Gen Alphers watching this, an expansion pack is an archaic, typically physical method of releasing new content for an already existing game. You guys know what a fucking disc is, right? And I happily tried the game out because enjoying a classic COD game for the first time is something I thought I'd never be able to experience again. So how good exactly is Call of Duty United Offensive? Well, strap in, because I guarantee you, it'll be a blast. point on our patrol. The sooner you men can scout that ridge over there, the sooner we can get back and get some hot chow. Hey, Sarge, can't we just skip the patrol and go straight to the hot chow? Ender, I'd find that funny if I wasn't freezing my can off. Now get out of here. Meet back at the Jeep when you've done your... 
just like COD 1, United Offensive starts us off with the American campaign. There's no D-Day mission this time around, airborne or otherwise. Instead, we're placed in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944, which makes sense since that's where the last American campaign left off. And since this game is technically a sequel, we have Captain Foley and Sergeant Moody. Moody as reoccurring characters. No Private Martin, though. I can only assume that his Rambo-esque type luck finally caught up to him. Well, I see the chain of command is every bit as incompetent as ever. The first mission starts off simple enough. You, the sergeant, and Private Ender are doing a routine patrol when all of a sudden the entire German Wehrmacht decides to spawn out of nowhere. Oh look, it's Private Koopman from World at War. No! Famously, and as you probably know, the 101st Airborne's actions during the battle revolved around the defense of Bastogne, and subsequent attack on the town of Foy. As such, this is also the large focus of these levels, with the addition of the 101st assault on the town of Noville. The first couple of missions here will start off around the late defense and break out of Bastogne, after the German spearhead has already been blunted. <laughs> Fuck me, man. Sorry, Dad, but all that trigger discipline didn't pay off, I guess. After finishing your all-in-a-day's-work patrol involving outrunning panzers and Audie Murphy and what feels like an entire division of infantry, you take part in what's probably the most well-known sequence from the game, defending Foley's field HQ against the same German armored units you just outran. And it's well-known for good reason. It feels almost like you're playing an episode of Band of Brothers. Granted, maybe a bit of a 90s action movie version of Band of Brothers, but still. Considering you're hopping from foxhole to foxhole, picking up deployable machine guns, sniper rifles, and rocket launchers. Swapping between them and systematically dismantling the entire attack like the god-tier being that you are. And hey, look at that, there are actual browning machine guns here, not just exclusively MG42s like in the last game. And just as it seems you've run out of rockets and are about to be overrun by the Panzers, Go get him, boys. Get Well, hello, second armored. There is one thing I really want to talk about, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, or at least not something I can hold too strongly against this game. So, it's been a while since I actually played COD 1, and I remember the damage system being similar to COD 2's, being that center mass shots with powerful guns like rifles kill instantly most of the time. But that doesn't seem to actually be the case here as it turns out. The way enemies take damage in United Offensive feels like they operate on a health bar system like you, the player. And that's not bad, per se, but held up to how damage works in COD 2, it is a bit annoying at times. And you may say, oh, well, it's not fair to make the comparison. Uh, of course the newer game would have the better gunplay. And it just shut up. The next mission begins in winter 1945 and serves as the preamble to the Battle of Foy. In the early morning hours of January 13th, you take part in an attack on a heavily defended crossroad south of the town, led by Sergeants Moody, Jones, and Ramirez. Ramirez. Even rescue some prisoners while you're at it too. Fun fact about this level, there are two American soldiers named Gordon and Freeman. I can offer you a battle you have no chance of winning. All things considered, it's a pretty fun level for how simple it may be. I especially love the ending where you assault the trench line and bunker at the actual crossroad, jumping from cover into clearing out the trenches and flanking around this small fortress and clearing it with grenades with your fellow 101st infantrymen. These are the types of engagements that made Call of Duty so popular to begin with, not this war zone shit. By the way, did you know the official abbreviation for COD points is CP? something to think about. After ambushing an armored column en route to Foy, you can regroup with your buddies and cap off the level. And speaking of Foy, boy oh boy is the next level of Choi. <laughs> I hate my fucking life, but Foy's a pretty fucking awesome mission. The opening to the mission begins with multiple companies of infantry with tank support charging from the wood line across the open fields around the town, all while coming under MG, Artie, and sniper fire. And apparently you can hold down the alt button to sprint. Has, it, has that always been there? There's even a duel between you and a sniper in the town. After breaching the heavily zeroed in perimeter of the town, you and your squad mates move from house to house and bulwark to bulwark, flushing out all Nazi resistance. Another pinpoint in this level is when you have to briefly defend your tanks from being swarmed by AT infantry squads. I guess all the Shermans lost their machine gunners out of nowhere. This is also the point in the game where I realized this, again, not 
killer flaw, but one I'm glad was changed for Call of Duty 2. And for that matter, most of the rest of the series as well. But there are plenty of instances in United Offensive where the player health bar becomes a bit of a problem. And this right here is a perfect example of it. As you can probably tell, this bridge that I and my teammates are trying to cross is coming under some heavy fire. More specifically, it's taking enveloping fire from the left flank via multiple MG42s, it's taking enveloping fire from the right flank from infantry in a trench line, and it's taking fire from the machine gun and cannon from a Tiger tank. And besides all that, the Shermans right behind me don't feel like moving in to support me at all. Oh wait, yeah, my bad. Sherman bad. Tiger good. Sherman stupid. Monsieur! I moved onto this bridge with about 60 to 70% of my health, which is pretty decent. And I died several frustrating times whenever I would even think about moving out of cover. And you may be thinking, oh, well, we'll just pick off the machine gunners and move up. It's as shrimple as that. Yeah, easier said than done, I'm afraid. I think the enemies infinitely respawn until you cross the bridge all the way. Some NES shit like that or whatever. In COD 1, I mostly never had an issue with the lack of regenerating health because many of the levels were designed to be restricted in close quarters enough for there to always be plenty of cover and opportunities for clearing out resistance and multiple tactical approaches. But here, with the more open, large-scale, and choke-point-filled approaches maps often take, the solid map design can, ironically in tandem with the fixed health, serve as a partial handicap feeling not so much as a challenge, but just being flat out unfair at times. Some of the more purest old school FPS fans may be shouting skill issue right now, but there's a time and a place for everything, right? And going forward, I do think it's a good thing that Call of Duty adopted the regenerating health for future entries. But eventually you do cross the bridge and destroy the Tiger tank. <laughs> Good work, boys. Count your arms, legs, and follow me. I'm real proud of all of you. That dinner I promised will have to wait, but I want you to know I'm good for you. That dinner I promised will have to wait. Now, being that this is an expansion pack and not a mainline game, you can't expect it to be super long. Or, well, actually, maybe its length is par for the course after all. Following Foy, we've reached the end of the American campaign with the assault on Noville. And it's a good send-off, even if it's not as good as Foy. The level begins pretty standardly. You dismount your tanks and go from house to house driving back the German defenders while the main force advances down the town's main street. The highlight of the mission comes up when the greater area of the town has been cleared and the Germans take up defensive positions within the chateau in the town center, moving from room to room until the town has been fully secured, right? Son of a gun. Captain, you might want to take a look. They got a whole division moving in. Cover the windows and doors. Hold your fire until they're in range. All of a sudden, a massive wave of German reinforcements arrive in an armor-supported counter-assault. This sequence actually kind of reminds me of Pavlov's house from the first game, as you run around the chateau setting up in machine gun positions to hit masses of infantry and destroy tanks with your bazooka. Although the bit where you have to defend Sergeant Moody is pretty damn annoying. However, it seems that with each panzer tank you destroy, more and more seem to arrive. And just as you're about to be overwhelmed and lose the town once again... Guys, this may be the hardest day I've been through. The proudest I've been of the men in my command. Anderson, go get that champagne we found. Dinner's on the way. The drinks are on me. Lamau, half the company is dead. Alright, now let's get to the mid part of the game, both in a literal and opinionated sense. Oh, here we go, continuing the grand classic COD tradition of making the British the least fun faction to play as. But, good old bloody here is held up from being forgettable by having some very unique quirks to it. I dare even say it can be fun at times. I know, ugh. Fuck the British. I really fucking love this mission. Like, a lot. I found myself going back and replaying it a few times while making this video even. It's one of those, if you've done something right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all kind of memes. 
For starters, I think it's absolutely amazing that you can actually move freely about the plane without restrictions. Not even World at War did that with its own Air Force mission. You get a really good sense for how claustrophobic it must have been to be a part of a bomber crew. And it also hits you that, yeah, being aboard a B-17 was probably fucking terrifying. There seems to be this conception, in the US at least, that B-17s, these flying fortresses, were next to invincible. Yeah, they, they, they were not. These things sucked. Like, yeah, okay, they can lose a big chunk of their hulls and still fly. That's still like half the men aboard fucking killed or wounded. Best case scenario, they get shot dead or take a piece of shrapnel to the cerebrum. Worst case scenario, they get sucked out of the plane without a functioning parachute. Literally a third of all B-17s were lost before the war ended. Either during runs or because they were so badly damaged they were just scrapped after a mission. You're not so much decked in a suit of armor, more like stuffed in an aluminum tube. Unless you're in the ball turret, then you're just stuffed in a glass sphere. Memphis Bell comes to mind, or even that B-17 sequence from Heavy Metal. This mission is as much a tense borderline horror segment for me as much as it is a badass action segment, and I really appreciate it. You could make a solid VR title out of this level alone. Dick sucking aside, how does it actually play? Pretty well, actually. The machine guns are all very well suspended and feel very punchy to hit Messerschmitts with. And the Messerschmitts themselves don't go down instantly. They take a few seconds of fire before being disabled. And what's interesting is that your plane isn't just a glorified turret either. It takes damage from strafes like you'd expect it to in a vehicle level. And there are scripted cinematic moments in the mission where chunks of the plane will be blown off or crewmen are killed in action. I feel as though if any game is going to include a segment involving a bombing run, it should use this level as a foundation or inspiration. It is that good, but of course, it can't last forever. Was zum Teufel? Achtung, Engländer! Achtung! Angriff! This is the part where you'll probably expect me to moan and groan about how I prefer battles over special operations in World War II games, but I'm not going to do that yet, because this is actually a pretty fun mission. After surviving your fall from the sky, you're rescued from a German patrol by SAS Major Ingram, and unexpectedly, a group of Dutch resistance fighters. It's not every day you see those guys in a video game. They got their spiffy orange armbands and made-up goblin names. The fuck kind of name is Goris? Is that like Boris, but like, spelt wrong? Dutch looks like English if it were written by a four-month-old cave baby. The ultimate goal of your group is to destroy a rail bridge before a German supply train can cross over it. And to get there, there's a garrison farm you have to clear and later used as a fallback position, before moving through the hills and approaching the rail line. Is this a Led Zeppelin reference? And the area around the bridge itself is pretty well garrisoned, with a multitude of watchtowers, bunkers, and a few dozen infantrymen. And of course, as soon as you clear the way of Germans... Wait! Wait! Hey Adolf, have you ever played this little game called Black Ops 3? Now being hunted down by every German unit in Holland, your scrappy group of partisans have to run back to the farm from the start of the level while being pursued, running and gunning and grenade spamming all the way. Requisitioning a Wehrmacht truck, you, as the Dutch say, vluchten, the heck out of Dodge. Sometime later, you're transferred from the RAF into the SAS for your heroic actions in Holland, leading us into the final mission of the British campaign. And we're not going out with a bang so much as we're going out with an uncaring shrug. A shrug being shrugged in Capo Muro di Porco Sicily. That's not how you say it. Not a bad mission, but it's just, eh. The level is all about raiding a heavily fortified coastal base on the Sicilian coast prior to the launch of Operation Husky. If we had a mission involving Operation Husky, that'd have been kind of cool, but no, 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 that, that's fine, I, I don't care. Drawing out a large portion of the garrison by blowing up a lighthouse, you and your fellow commandos infiltrate the base, penetrating deep into the bowels of the fortress, planting charges on large coastal guns, and the base's primary magazine. At least the base itself is pretty cool looking though, with this mix of styles between modern militarism and medieval castle. Reminds me of the Clint Eastwood film, Where Eagles Dare. After planting your explosives, you flee the base, all guns blazing, but your primary route of escape 
escape is cut off to you, and you lose all of your commando friends to a tank shell. Except for Ingram, of course. He still has to make an appearance in the Austrian Alps. I think this second part of the mission is why a lot of people like this campaign so much. But it's not that good. The first half of this level is you and your little sidecar passenger seat shooting wildly at German trucks, until eventually you have to ditch it and run on foot to a small dock. And I was looking forward to this section of the campaign. I really was. It is flaunted on the Steam page, after all. Yeah, I was totally ready to just take out those fucking PT boats. Yay. It's dull. Nothing to really complain about, but nothing to really praise either. At least the vehicle variety is good. Am I gonna complain about them adding this to the game? No, I mean, at least they tried something new. It's just, you know, they should have tried harder. And that's the British campaign done with. In a nutshell, masterpiece, good, meh. I give this a solid 6 out of 10. The Soviet campaign, much like in COD 1, is hands down the best mission roster in the game. Every level here is flawless, well, for the most part anyway, and so much fun to play through. A mwah, gorgeous chunk of Call of Duty history. That being said, I saved a lot during these missions. This campaign is hard as fuck. That's another thing, remember to save often because the checkpoint system is garbage tank. The game starts off during the defense round Kursk during Operation Citadel a massive German offensive meant to revive the Wehrmacht's initiative on the Eastern Front. And everything about this level is just perfect. This is hands down, in my opinion, the best mission in the game. This opening bit of cinematic gameplay is great, but the real cherry on top is when you have to wait in a line of fellow Red Army soldiers, getting some ammo handed to you and being pushed out into the trenches. And all you can do is just wait for the mechanized onslaught. It's a tense, long sequence that really sets the mood and gets your adrenaline running. And once the krauts finally appear, you can do nothing but plant yourself in one spot and shoot. Well, no, of course you can move around Around. But remember, not one step backwards, comrades. Although your part of the line is holding well, other areas are being broken into by Fritz. They even use flamethrowers to help in doing so, but eventually you're able to flush them out. But the attack is far from over. The Germans must hit harder if they're to break through the Russian trench lines. So they bring these big hulking pieces of fucking junk elephant tanks. But being the lugging piles of scrap they are, you make pretty short work of them. The level ends with you and your comrades assaulting a small hamlet the Germans have managed to overrun and retaking it, and also subsequently holding it against some tanks and infantry that remain in the attack, until your T-34 support arrives. You're given a speech from a commissar atop a tank that Reznov would shamelessly steal four years later and given your new orders. For the next mission, your unit is transferred northwards of Kursk to join in on an attack against a town called Poneri, a small village with the rail yard and a large factory the Germans are using for tank production, both of which are used as combat locations as well as the actual town itself. The train station is the first objective, as your T-34s take out the panzers guarding its main junction. Under enfilade and sniper fire, the train station is eventually cleared along with the surrounding area. The clearing of the village is pretty standard, but well designed. You not only take buildings, but you also blow up tanks from behind with dynamite. The big selling point, however, really is the factory. Finding an opening, you lead Red Army soldiers into the large and fully interiored building, slowly liquidating this last large pocket of resistance. Taking a page from the Soviet playbook at Stalingrad, the Germans do manage to roll off one last tank from the production line and throw it into combat against the Russian troops swarming into the factory. Not that it really does much good at all. Comrades, we have driven the enemy from Paniri, and we will not rest! until the whole German army has been driven off Russian soil! Okay, I'll be honest with you guys. I don't really like tanks in Call of Duty. Tank missions in this franchise for me tend to just be really, really bland. World at War's tank mission is decent, but even then, I don't often replay it. And this here? 
this is no different. By level design alone, I think it's a big step up from the COD 1 mission, but man, it's just not that fun. Part of the reason why I don't like it too much, and for that matter, it's the same in one, is because you don't have a machine gun you can use, only your main turret. And this is a huge issue when you consider that there are a bunch of AT infantry running around all over the place. And just in general, the combat is not satisfying at all. So much fun, wow. And aside from getting startled by an elephant tank, Fuck, that is an elephant. Nothing really stands out, so I'll stop talking about it now. But after this small little bump in the road, we can get to the last couple of levels in the game. Advance! Advance! No stopping! Don't fall back! The remainder of the Soviet campaign is dedicated to retaking the city of Kharkov, or Kharkiv whichever you prefer. Naturally, being a large ruined city, that's also a very important strategic point to maintain for the Nazis. The resistance you're met with is fierce, to say the least. Already in the opening stages of the assault, your infantry and tank forces have already been shredded by machine gun and AT fire. Oh, Marshal, are you sure it's wise to be this close to the front lines? The only way to efficiently make way for a continuation of the assault is to flatten the enemy defenses with artillery, which naturally you the player are responsible for calling in, who else would? The rest of this first level has you charging through the outskirts of Kharkov, clearing a path down the main road for your armor to move forward, with the addition of advancing through alleys to flank German garrisons and to clear courtyards yards, slowly advancing towards the square in the city center, the city center being the first point of interest in the final level of the game. After leaping forth from your side of the front lines, you charge into the enemy territory with the ultimate goal of smashing out into the opposite end of the city, and capturing the critical Kharkov train station. And the large obstacle in your way is this monstrous line of defense, a wall of machine guns and anti-tank weaponry halting your momentum dead in its tracks. And the only way to clear these barricades is by defending your comrade engineers so they can plant to explosives and blow the line to pieces. After securing the square, the Luftwaffe, who apparently knew in advance the exact time the Germans would be driven back, arrive overhead to bombard you and your friends to shit. Luckily for you, you single-handedly saved the entire Soviet army again by manning the only AA gun around and blowing the entire bomber fleet from the sky. As long as heart of this army. Now the Germans have nowhere left to run except for the railway station close to the outside of the city, and they throw everything they have into holding onto this last bit of Kharkov, making for an intense final action set piece. While the Red Army infantry take up cover and exchange shots between the German infantry, you the player can mount AA turrets and cannons to blow Stuka dive bombers out of the air, as well as turn them against the enemy tanks and half-tracks. This goes on for a while, with the Germans steadily getting closer and closer, and it seems like they're about to push you back into the city, halting the offensive, when unexpectedly out of nowhere, Wow, I can't believe Reznov would shamelessly steal this same strategic redeployment maneuver four years later. I forgot to mention this in the COD 2 video, but all the classic Call of Duties do this cool little cinematic thing at the end of their campaigns. No, we're not gonna watch it all. <laughs> 